Chapter One, Part D of the Wealth of Nations, Book Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, Book Five, Chapter One, Part D, of the Expenses of the Sovereign or Commonwealth. Joint stock companies, established either by royal charter or by act of parliament, are different in several respects, not only from regulated companies, but from private copartneries. First, in a private copartnery, no partner without the consent of the company can transfer his share to another person, or introduce a new member into the company. Each member, however, may, upon proper warning, withdraw from the copartnery and demand payment from them of his share of the common stock. In a joint stock company, on the contrary, no member can demand payment of his share from the company, but each member can, without their consent, transfer his share to another person and thereby introduce a new member. The value of a share in a joint stock is always the price which it will bring in the market, and this may be either greater or less in any proportion than the sum which its owner stands credited for in the stock of the company. Secondly, in a private copartnery, each partner is bound for the debts contracted by the company, to the whole extent of his fortune. In a joint stock company, on the contrary, each partner is bound only to the extent of his share. The trade of a joint stock company is always managed by a court of directors. This court, indeed, is frequently subject, in many respects, to the control of a general court of proprietors. But the greater part of these proprietors seldom pretend to understand anything of the business of the company and when the spirit of faction happens not to prevail among them give themselves no trouble about it but receive contentedly such half yearly or yearly dividend as the directors think proper to make to them this total exemption from trouble and from risk beyond a limited sum encourages many people to become adventurers in joint stock companies who would upon no account hazard their fortunes in any private copartnery such companies, therefore, commonly draw to themselves much greater stocks than any private copartnery can boast of. The trading stock of the South Sea Company at one time amounted to upwards of thirty-three millions eight hundred thousand pounds. The dividend capital of the Bank of England amounts at present to ten millions seven hundred and eighty thousand pounds. The directors of such companies, however, being the managers rather of other people's money than of their own, it cannot well be expected that they should watch over it with the same anxious vigilance with which the partners in a private copartnery frequently watch over their own. Like the stewards of a rich man, they are apt to consider attention to small matters as not for their master's honor, and very easily give themselves a dispensation from having it. Negligence and profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less, in the management of the affairs of such a company. It is upon this account that joint stock companies for foreign trade have seldom been able to maintain the competition against private adventurers. They have, accordingly, very seldom succeeded without an exclusive privilege, and frequently have not succeeded with one. Without an exclusive privilege, they have commonly mismanaged the trade. With an exclusive privilege, they have both mismanaged and confined it. The Royal African Company the predecessors of the present African company, had an exclusive privilege by charter, but as that charter had not been confirmed by act of parliament, the trade, in consequence of the declaration of rights, was, soon after the revolution, laid open to all his majesty's subjects. The Hudson's Bay Company are, as to their legal rights, in the same situation as the Royal African Company. Their exclusive charter has not been confirmed by act of parliament. The South Sea Company, as long as they continued to be a trading company, had an exclusive privilege confirmed by Act of Parliament, as have likewise the present United Company of Merchants trading to the East Indies. The Royal African Company soon found that they could not maintain the competition against private adventurers, whom, notwithstanding the Declaration of Rights, they continued for some time to call interlopers, and to persecute as such. In 1698, however, the private adventurers were subject to a duty of 10% upon almost all the different branches of their trade, to be employed by the company in the maintenance of their forts and garrisons. But, notwithstanding this heavy tax, the company were still unable to maintain the competition. Their stock and credit gradually declined. 
in 1712, their debts had become so great that a particular act of Parliament was thought necessary both for their security and for that of their creditors. It was enacted that the resolution of two-thirds of these creditors in number and value should bind the rest, both with regard to the time which should be allowed to the company for the payment of their debts, and with regard to any other agreement which it might be thought proper to make with them concerning those debts. In 1730, their affairs were in so great disorder that they were altogether incapable of maintaining their forts and garrisons, the sole purpose and pretext of their institution. From that year till their final dissolution, the Parliament judged it necessary to allow the annual sum of ten thousand pounds for that purpose. In 1732, after having been for many years losers by the trade of carrying negroes to the West Indies, they at last resolved to give it up altogether to sell to the private traders to America the negroes which they purchased upon the coast, and to employ their servants in the trade to the inland parts of Africa for gold dust, elephant's teeth, dyeing drugs, etc. But their success in this more confined trade was not greater than in their former extensive one. Their affairs continued to go gradually to decline, till at last, being in every respect a bankrupt company, they were dissolved by act of Parliament, and their forts and garrisons vested in the present regulated company of merchants trading to Africa. Before the erection of the Royal African Company, there had been three other joint stock companies successfully established, one after another, for the African trade. They were all equally unsuccessful. They all, however, had exclusive charters, which, though not confirmed by act of Parliament, were in those days supposed to convey a real exclusive privilege. The Hudson's Bay Company, before their misfortunes in the late war, had been much more fortunate than the Royal African Company. Their necessary expense is much smaller. The whole number of people whom they maintain in their different settlements and habitations, which they have honored with the name of forts, is said not to exceed a hundred and twenty persons. This number, however, is sufficient to prepare beforehand the cargo of furs and other goods necessary for loading their ships, which, on account of the ice, can seldom remain above six or eight weeks in those seas. This advantage of having a cargo ready prepared could not, for several years, be acquired by private adventurers, and without it there seems to be no possibility of trading to Hudson's Bay. The moderate capital of the company, which, it is said, does not exceed one hundred and ten thousand pounds, may, besides, be sufficient to enable them to engross the whole, or almost the whole trade and surplus produce, of the miserable though extensive country comprehended within their charter. No private adventurers, accordingly, have ever attempted to trade to that country in competition with them. This company, therefore, have always enjoyed an exclusive trade, in fact, though they may have no right to it in law. Over and above all this, the moderate capital of this company is said to be divided among a very small number of proprietors. But a joint stock company, consisting of a small number of proprietors, with a moderate capital, approaches very nearly to the nature of a private copartnery, and may be capable of nearly the same degree of vigilance and attention. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, if, in consequence of these different advantages, the Hudson's Bay Company had, before the late war, been able to carry on their trade with a considerable degree of success. It does not seem probable, however, that their profits ever approached to what the late Mr. Dobbs imagined them. A much more sober and judicious writer, Mr. Anderson, author of the Historical and Chronological Deduction of Commerce, very justly observes that upon examining the accounts which Mr. Dobbs himself has given for several years together of their exports and imports, and upon making proper allowances for their extraordinary risk and expense, it does not appear that their profits deserve to be envied, or that they can much, if at all, exceed the ordinary profits of trade. The South Sea Company never had any forts or garrisons to maintain and therefore were entirely exempted from one great expense, to which other joint stock companies for foreign trade are subject. But they had an immense capital divided among an immense number of proprietors. It was naturally to be expected, therefore, that folly, negligence, and profusion should prevail in the whole management of their affairs. The knavery and extravagance of their stock-jobbing projects are sufficiently known, and the explication of them would be foreign to the present subject. Their mercantile projects were not much better conducted. The first trade which they engaged in was that of supplying the Spanish West Indies with Negroes, of which, in consequence of what was called the Asiento contract granted them by the Treaty of Utrecht, they had the exclusive privilege. 
but as it was not expected that much profit could be made by this trade, both the Portuguese and French companies, who had enjoyed it upon the same terms before them, having been ruined by it, they were allowed, as compensation, to send annually a ship of a certain burden, to trade directly to the Spanish West Indies. Of the ten voyages which this annual ship was allowed to make, they are said to have gained considerably by one, that of the Royal Caroline, in 1731, and to have been losers, more or less, by almost all the rest. Their ill success was imputed, by their factors and agents, to the extortion and oppression of the Spanish government, but was, perhaps, principally owing to the profusion and depredations of those very factors and agents, some of whom are said to have acquired great fortunes, even in one year. In 1734, the company petitioned the king that they might be allowed to dispose of the trade and tonnage of their annual ship, on account of the little profit which they made by it, and to accept of such equivalent as they could obtain from the king of Spain. In 1724, this company had undertaken the whale fishery. Of this, indeed, they had no monopoly, but as long as they carried it on, no other British subjects appear to have engaged in it. Of the eight voyages which their ships made to Greenland, they were gainers by one, and losers by all the rest. After their eighth and last voyage, when they had sold their ships, stores, and utensils, they found that their whole loss upon this branch, capital and interest included, amounted to upwards of two hundred and thirty-seven thousand pounds. In 1722, this company petitioned the Parliament to be allowed to divide their immense capital of more than thirty-three millions eight hundred thousand pounds, the whole of which had been lent to government, into two equal parts, the one half, or upwards of sixteen million nine hundred thousand pounds, to be put upon the same footing with other government annuities, and not to be subject to the debts contracted, or losses incurred, by the directors of the company, in the prosecution of their mercantile projects, the other half to remain as before a trading stock, and to be subject to those debts and losses. The petition was too reasonable not to be granted, in 1733 they again petitioned the Parliament that three-fourths of their trading stock might be turned into annuity stock, and only one-fourth remain as trading stock, or exposed to the hazards arising from the bad management of their directors. Both their annuity and trading stocks had, by this time, been reduced more than two millions each, by several different payments from government, so that this fourth amounted only to three million six hundred and sixty two thousand seven hundred and eighty four pounds eight shillings sixpence in seventeen forty eight all the demands of the company upon the king of spain in consequence of the asiento contract were by the treaty of aix la chapelle given up for what was supposed an equivalent an end was put to their trade with the spanish west indies the remainder of their trading stock was turned into an annuity stock, and the company ceased, in every respect, to be a trading company. It ought to be observed that in the trade which the South Sea Company carried on by means of their annual ship, the only trade by which it ever was expected that they could make any considerable profit, they were not without competitors, either in the foreign or in the home market. At Carthagena, Portobello, and La Veracruz, they had to encounter the competition of the Spanish merchants, who brought from Cadiz to those markets European goods of the same kind with the outward cargo of their ship, and in England they had to encounter that of the English merchants, who imported from Cadiz goods of the Spanish West Indies, of the same kind with the inward cargo. The goods, both of the Spanish and English merchants, indeed, were perhaps subject to higher duties. But the loss occasioned by the negligence, profusion and malversation of the servants of the company had probably been a tax much heavier than all those duties that a joint stock company should be able to carry on successfully any branch of foreign trade when private adventurers can come into any sort of open and fair competition with them seems contrary to all experience the old english east india company was established in sixteen hundred by a charter from queen elizabeth in the first twelve voyages which they fitted out for india they appear to have traded as a regulated company with separate stocks though only in the general ships of the company in sixteen twelve they united into a joint stock their charter was exclusive and though not confirmed by act of parliament was in those days supposed to convey a real exclusive privilege for many years therefore they were not much disturbed by interlopers their capital, which never exceeded seven hundred and forty-four thousand pounds, and of which fifty pounds was a share, 
was not so exorbitant, nor their dealings so extensive, as to afford either a pretext for gross negligence and profusion, or a cover to gross malversation. Notwithstanding some extraordinary losses, occasioned partly by the malice of the Dutch East India Company, and partly by other accidents, they carried on for many years a successful trade. But in process of time, when the principles of liberty were better understood, it became every day more and more doubtful how far a royal charter, not confirmed by act of parliament, could convey an exclusive privilege. Upon this question the decisions of the courts of justice were not uniform, but varied with the authority of government and the humors of the times. Interlopers multiplied upon them, and towards the end of the reign of Charles the Second, through the whole of that of James the Second, and during a part of that of William the Third, reduced them to great distress. In 1698, a proposal was made to Parliament of advancing two millions to government at eight per cent, provided the subscribers were erected into a new East India Company, with exclusive privileges. The old East India Company offered seven hundred thousand pounds, nearly the amount of their capital, at four per cent upon the same conditions but such was at that time the state of public credit that it was more convenient for government to borrow two millions at eight per cent than seven hundred thousand pounds at four the proposal of the new subscribers was accepted and a new east india company established in consequence the old east india company however had a right to continue their trade till seventeen o one they had at the same time in the name of their treasurer subscribed very artfully three hundred and fifteen thousand pounds into the stock of the new by a negligence in the expression of the act of parliament which vested the east india trade in the subscribers to this loan of two millions it did not appear evident that they were all obliged to unite into a joint stock a few private traders whose subscriptions amounted only to seven thousand two hundred pounds insisted upon the privilege of trading separately upon their own stocks and at their own risks the old east india company had a right to a separate trade upon their own stock till seventeen o one and they had likewise both before and after that period a right like that of other private traders to a separate trade upon the three hundred and fifteen thousand pounds which they had subscribed into the stock of the new company the competition of the two companies with the private traders and with one another is said to have well nigh ruined both upon a subsequent occasion in seventeen fifty when a proposal was made to parliament for putting the trade under the management of a regulated company and thereby laying it in some measure open the east india company in opposition to this proposal represented in very strong terms what had been at this time the miserable effects as they thought of them of this competition in india they said it raised the price of goods so high that they were not worth the buying and in england by overstocking the market it sunk their price so low that no profit could be made by them that by a more plentiful supply to the great advantage and conveniency of the public it must have reduced very much the price of india goods in the english market cannot well be doubted but that it should have raised very much their price in the indian market seems not very probable as all the extraordinary demand which that competition could occasion must have been but as a drop of water in the immense ocean of indian commerce the increase of demand besides though in the beginning it may sometimes raise the price of goods never fails to lower it in the long run it encourages production and thereby increases the competition of the producers who in order to undersell one another have recourse to new divisions of labor and new improvements of art which might never otherwise have been thought of the miserable effects of which the company complained were the cheapness of consumption and the encouragement given to production precisely the two effects which it is the great business of political economy to promote the competition however of which they gave this doleful account had not been allowed to be of long continuance in seventeen o two the two companies were in some measure united by an indenture tripartite to which the queen was the third party and in seventeen o eight they were by act of parliament perfectly consolidated into one company by their present name of the united company of merchants trading to the east indies into this act it was thought worth while to insert a clause allowing the separate traders to continue their trade till michaelmas seventeen eleven but at the same time empowering the directors upon three years notice to redeem their little capital of seven thousand two hundred pounds and thereby to convert the whole stock of the company into a joint stock by the same act the capital of the company in consequence of a new loan to government 
was augmented from two millions to three millions two hundred thousand pounds. In 1743, the company advanced another million to government. But this million being raised, not by a call upon the proprietors, but by selling annuities and contracting bond debts, it did not augment the stock upon which the proprietors could claim a dividend. It augmented, however, their trading stock, it being equally liable with the other three millions two hundred thousand pounds to the losses sustained and debts contracted by the company in prosecution of their mercantile projects. From 1708, or at least from 1711, this company, being delivered from all competitors, and fully established in the monopoly of the English commerce to the East Indies, carried on a successful trade, and from their profits made annually a moderate dividend to their proprietors. During the French War, which began in 1741, the ambition of Mr. Duplex, the French governor of Pondicherry, involved them in the wars of the Carnatic, and in the politics of the Indian princes. After many signal successes, and equally signal losses, they at last lost Madras, at that time their principal settlement in India. It was restored to them by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, and about this time the spirit of war and conquest seems to have taken possession of their servants in India, and never since to have left them. During the French War, which began in 1755, their arms partook of the general good fortune of those of Great Britain. They defended Madras, took Pondicherry, recovered Calcutta, and acquired the revenues of a rich and extensive territory, amounting, it was then said, to upwards of three millions a year. They remained for several years in quiet possession of this revenue, but in 1767 administration laid claim to their territorial acquisitions, and the revenue arising from them, as of right belonging to the crown and the company, in compensation for this claim, agreed to pay to government four hundred thousand pounds a year. They had, before this, gradually augmented their dividend from about six to ten per cent. That is, upon their capital of three millions two hundred thousand pounds, they had increased it by one hundred and twenty-eight thousand pounds, or had raised it from one hundred and ninety-two thousand to three hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year. They were attempting about this time to raise it still further, to 12.5%, which would have made their annual payments to their proprietors equal to what they had agreed to pay annually to government, or to £400,000 a year. But during the two years in which their agreement with government was to take place, they were restrained from any further increase of dividend by two successive acts of Parliament, of which the object was to enable them to make a speedier progress in the payment of their debts, which were at this time estimated at upwards of six or seven millions sterling. In 1769, they renewed their agreement with government for five years more, and stipulated that during the course of that period they should be allowed gradually to increase their dividend to twelve and a half per cent, never increasing it, however, more than one per cent in one year. This increase of dividend, therefore, when it had risen to its utmost height, could augment their annual payments, to their proprietors and government together, but by six hundred and eighty thousand pounds, beyond what they had been before their late territorial acquisitions. What the gross revenue of those territorial acquisitions was supposed to amount to has already been mentioned, and by an account brought by the Crutenden East Indiaman in 1769, the neat revenue, clear of all deductions and military charges, was stated at two millions forty-eight thousand seven hundred and forty-seven pounds. They were said, at the same time, to possess another revenue, arising partly from lands, but chiefly from the customs established at their different settlements, amounting to four hundred and thirty-nine thousand pounds. The profits of their trade, too, according to the evidence of their chairman before the House of Commons, amounted at this time to at least four hundred thousand pounds a year, according to that of their accountant, to at least five hundred thousand pounds, according to the lowest account, at least equal to the highest dividend that was to be paid to their proprietors. So great a revenue might certainly have afforded an augmentation of six hundred and eighty thousand pounds in their annual payments, and at the same time have left a large sinking fund sufficient for the speedy reduction of their debt. In 1773, however, their debts, instead of being reduced, were augmented by an arrear to the treasury in the payment of the four hundred thousand pounds, by another to the custom house for duties unpaid, by a large debt to the bank for money borrowed, and by a fourth for bills drawn upon them from India, 
and wantonly accepted, to the amount of upwards of twelve hundred thousand pounds. The distress which these accumulated claims brought upon them obliged them not only to reduce all at once their dividend to six per cent, but to throw themselves upon the mercy of government, and to supplicate, first, a release from the further payment of the stipulated four hundred thousand pounds a year, and, secondly, a loan of fourteen hundred thousand to save them from immediate bankruptcy. The great increase of their fortune had, it seems, only served to furnish their servants with a pretext for greater profusion, and a cover for greater malversation, than in proportion even to that increase of fortune. The conduct of their servants in India, and the general state of their affairs both in India and in Europe, became the subject of a parliamentary inquiry, in consequence of which several very important alterations were made in the constitution of their government, both at home and abroad. In India, their principal settlements of Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta, which had before been altogether independent of one another, were subjected to a governor-general, assisted by a council of four assessors, parliament assuming to itself the first nomination of this governor and council, who were to reside at Calcutta, that city having now become, what Madras was before, the most important of the English settlements in India. The court of the mayor of Calcutta, originally instituted for the trial of mercantile causes which arose in the city and neighborhood had gradually extended its jurisdiction with the extension of the empire it was now reduced and confined to the original purpose of its institution instead of it a new supreme court of judicature was established consisting of a chief justice and three judges to be appointed by the crown in europe the qualification necessary to entitle a proprietor to vote at their general courts was raised from five hundred pounds the original price of a share in the stock of the company to a thousand pounds in order to vote upon this qualification too it was declared necessary that he should have possessed it if acquired by his own purchase and not by inheritance for at least one year instead of six months the term requisite before the court of twenty-four directors had before been chosen annually but it was now enacted that each director should for the future be chosen for four years six of them however to go out of office by rotation every year and not be capable of being re-chosen at the election of the six new directors for the ensuing year in consequence of these alterations the courts both of the proprietors and directors it was expected would be likely to act with more dignity and steadiness than they had usually done before but it seems impossible by any alterations to render those courts in any respect fit to govern or even to share in the government of a great empire because the greater part of their members must always have too little interest in the prosperity of that empire to give any serious attention to what may promote it frequently a man of great sometimes even a man of small fortune is willing to purchase a thousand pounds share of india stock merely for the influence which he expects to acquire by a vote in the court of proprietors it gives him a share though not in the plunder yet in the appointment of the plunderers of india the court of directors though they make that appointment be necessarily more or less under the influence of the proprietors who not only elect those directors but sometimes overrule the appointments of their servants in india provided he can enjoy this influence for a few years and thereby provide for a certain number of his friends he frequently cares little about the dividend or even about the value of the stock upon which his vote is founded about the prosperity of the great empire in the government of which that vote gives him a share he seldom cares at all no other sovereigns ever were or from the nature of things ever could be so perfectly indifferent about the happiness or misery of their subjects the improvement or waste of their dominions the glory or disgrace of their administration as from irresistible moral causes the greater part of the proprietors of such a mercantile company are and necessarily must be this indifference too was more likely to be increased than diminished by some of the new regulations which were made in consequence of the parliamentary inquiry by a resolution of the house of commons for example it was declared that when the one million four hundred thousand pounds lent to the company by government should be paid and their bond debts be reduced to one million five hundred thousand pounds they might then and not till then divide eight per cent upon their capital and that whatever remained of their revenues and neat profits at home should be divided into four parts 
three of them to be paid into the exchequer for the use of the public, and the fourth to be reserved as a fund, either for the further reduction of their bond debts, or for the discharge of other contingent exigencies which the company might labor under. But if the company were bad stewards and bad sovereigns, when the whole of their neat revenue and profits belonged to themselves, and were at their own disposal, they would surely not likely to be better when three-fourths of them were to belong to other people, and the other fourth, though to be laid out for the benefit of the company, yet to be so under the inspection and with the approbation of other people. It might be more agreeable to the company that their own servants and dependents should have either the pleasure of wasting or the profit of embezzling whatever surplus might remain after paying the proposed dividend of eight per cent than that it should come into the hands of a set of people with whom those resolutions could scarce fail to set them in some measure at variance the interest of those servants and dependents might so far predominate in the court of proprietors as sometimes to dispose it to support the authors of depredations which had been committed in direct violation of its own authority with the majority of proprietors the support even of the authority of their own court might sometimes be a matter of less consequence than the support of those who had set that authority at defiance the regulations of 1773, accordingly, did not put an end to the disorder of the company's government in India. Notwithstanding that, during a momentary fit of good conduct, they had at one time collected into the treasury of Calcutta more than three million pounds sterling, notwithstanding that they had afterwards extended either their dominion or their depredations over a vast accession of some of the richest and most fertile countries in India, all was wasted and destroyed they found themselves altogether unprepared to stop or resist the incursion of Hyder Ali, and in consequence of those disorders the company is now, 1784, in greater distress than ever, and, in order to prevent immediate bankruptcy, is once more reduced to supplicate the assistance of government. Different plans have been proposed by the different parties in Parliament for the better management of its affairs and all those plans seem to agree in supposing what was indeed always abundantly evident that it is altogether unfit to govern its territorial possessions even the company itself seems to be convinced of its own incapacity so far and seems upon that account willing to give them up to government with the right of possessing forts and garrisons in distant and barbarous countries is necessarily connected the right of making peace and war in those countries the joint stock companies which have had the one right have constantly exercised the other and have frequently had it expressly conferred upon them how unjustly how capriciously how cruelly they have commonly exercised it is too well known from recent experience when a company of merchants undertake at their own risk and expense to establish a new trade with some remote and barbarous nation it may not be unreasonable to incorporate them into a joint stock company and to grant them in case of their success a monopoly of the trade for a certain number of years it is the easiest and most natural way in which the state can recompense them for hazarding a dangerous and expensive experiment of which the public is afterwards to reap the benefit a temporary monopoly of this kind may be vindicated upon the same principles upon which a like monopoly of a new machine is granted to its inventor and that of a new book to its author but upon the expiration of the term the monopoly ought certainly to determine the forts and garrisons if it was found necessary to establish any to be taken into the hands of government their value to be paid to the company and the trade to be laid open to all the subjects of the state by a perpetual monopoly all the other subjects of the state are taxed very absurdly in two different ways first by the high price of goods which in the case of a free trade they could buy much cheaper and secondly by their total exclusion from a branch of business which it might be both convenient and profitable for many of them to carry on it is for the most worthless of all purposes too that they are taxed in this manner it is merely to enable the company to support the negligence profusion and malversation of their own servants whose disorderly conduct seldom allows the dividend of the company to exceed the ordinary rate of profit in trades which are altogether free and very frequently makes a fall even a good deal short of that rate without a monopoly however a joint stock company it would appear from experience cannot long carry on any branch of foreign trade to buy in one market in order to sell with profit in another when there are many competitors in both 
to watch over not only the occasional variations in the demand but the much greater and more frequent variations in the competition or in the supply which that demand is likely to get from other people and to suit with dexterity and judgment both the quantity and quality of each assortment of goods to all these circumstances is a species of warfare of which the operations are continually changing and which can scarce ever be conducted successfully without such an unremitting exertion of vigilance and attention as cannot long be expected from the directors of a joint stock company the east india company upon the redemption of their funds and the expiration of their exclusive privilege have a right by act of parliament to continue a corporation with a joint stock and to trade in their corporate capacity to the east indies in common with the rest of their fellow subjects but in this situation the superior vigilance and attention of a private adventurer would in all probability soon make them weary of the trade an eminent french author of great knowledge in matters of political economy the abbe morlet gives a list of fifty-five joint stock companies for foreign trade which have been established in different parts of europe since the year sixteen hundred and which according to him have all failed from mismanagement notwithstanding they had exclusive privileges he has been misinformed with regard to the history of two or three of them which were not joint stock companies and have not failed but in compensation there have been several joint stock companies which have failed and which he has omitted the only trades which it seems possible for a joint stock company to carry on successfully without an exclusive privilege are those of which all the operations are capable of being reduced to what is called a routine or to such a uniformity of method as admits of little or no variation of this kind is first the banking trade secondly the trade of insurance from fire and from sea risk and capture in time of war thirdly the trade of making and maintaining a navigable cut or canal and fourthly the similar trade of bringing water for the supply of a great city though the principles of the banking trade may appear somewhat abstruse the practice is capable of being reduced to strict rules to depart upon any occasion from those rules in consequence of some flattering speculation of extraordinary gain is almost always extremely dangerous and frequently fatal to the banking company which attempts it but the constitution of joint stock companies renders them in general more tenacious of established rules than any private copartnery such companies therefore seem extremely well fitted for this trade the principal banking companies in europe accordingly are joint stock companies many of which manage their trade very successfully without any exclusive privilege the bank of england has no other exclusive privilege except that no other banking company in england shall consist of more than six persons the two banks of edinburgh are joint stock companies without any exclusive privilege the value of the risk either from fire or from loss by sea or by capture though it cannot perhaps be calculated very exactly admits however of such a gross estimation as renders it in some degree reducible to strict rule and method the trade of insurance therefore may be carried on successfully by a joint stock company without any exclusive privilege neither the london assurance nor the royal exchange assurance companies have any such privilege when a navigable cut or canal has been once made the management of it becomes quite simple and easy and it is reducible to strict rule and method even the making of it is so as it may be contracted for with undertakers at so much a mile and so much a lock the same thing may be said of a canal an aqueduct or a great pipe for bringing water to supply a great city such undertakings therefore may be and accordingly frequently are very successfully managed by joint stock companies without any exclusive privilege to establish a joint stock company however for any undertaking merely because such a company might be capable of managing it successfully or to exempt a particular set of dealers from some of the general laws which take place with regard to all their neighbors merely because they might be capable of thriving if they had such an exemption would certainly not be reasonable to render such an establishment perfectly reasonable with the circumstance of being reducible to strict rule and method two other circumstances ought to occur first it ought to appear with the clearest evidence that the undertaking is of greater and more general utility than the greater part of common trades 
and secondly that it requires a greater capital than can easily be collected into a private copartnery if a moderate capital were sufficient the great utility of the undertaking would not be a sufficient reason for establishing a joint stock company because in this case the demand for what it was to produce would readily and easily be supplied by private adventurers in the four trades above mentioned both those circumstances concur the great and general utility of the banking trade when prudently managed has been fully explained in the second book of this inquiry but a public bank which is to support public credit and upon particular emergencies to advance to government the whole produce of a tax to the amount perhaps of several millions a year or two before it comes in requires a greater capital than can easily be collected into any private copartnery the trade of insurance gives greater security to the fortunes of private people and by dividing among a great many that loss which would ruin an individual makes it fall light and easy upon the whole society in order to give this security however it is necessary that the insurers should have a very large capital before the establishment of the two joint stock companies for insurance in london a list it is said was laid before the attorney general of one hundred and fifty private users who had failed in the course of a few years that navigable cuts and canals and the works which are sometimes necessary for supplying a great city with water are of great and general utility while at the same time they frequently require a greater expense than suits the fortunes of private people is sufficiently obvious except the four trades above mentioned i have not been able to recollect any other in which all the three circumstances requisite for rendering reasonable the establishment of a joint stock company concur the english copper company of london the lead smelting company the glass grinding company have not even the pretext of any great or singular utility in the object which they pursue nor does the pursuit of that object seem to require any expense unsuitable to the fortunes of many private men whether the trade which those companies carry on is reducible to such strict rule and method as to render it fit for the management of a joint stock company or whether they have any reason to boast of their extraordinary profits i do not pretend to know the mine adventurers company has been long ago bankrupt a share in the stock of the british linen company of edinburgh sells at present very much below par though less so than it did some years ago the joint stock companies which are established for the public spirited purpose of promoting some particular manufacture over and above managing their own affairs ill to the diminution of the general stock of the society can in other respects scarce ever fail to do more harm than good notwithstanding the most upright intentions the unavoidable partiality of their directors to particular branches of the manufacture of which the undertakers mislead and impose upon them is a real discouragement to the rest and necessarily breaks more or less that natural proportion which would otherwise establish itself between judicious industry and profit and which to the general industry of the country is of all encouragements the greatest and the most effectual end of book five chapter one part d